This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? Welcome to this listener story edition of Where Did the Road Go? I have four stories for you tonight, but before we get to that, uh, I did say we had some stuff in the works, and uh, one of those things is I have begun a Patreon account for this show. So, for uh, a small donation every month, you can help out Where Did the Road Go? And in return, we hope to be able to do an extra show every week, like a consistent second show every single week, in addition to the one you're already hearing. On top of that, as a patron, you will get uh, access to any multiple-part interviews all at once. So if we have David Politis on, and I usually pre-record those because they, they go two and a half to three hours and break them into parts, you will get access to all the parts when the first one airs, or as soon as they're prepared to go out, rather than having to wait a week. Uh, also, as a patron, we may do some small exclusive clips with various guests, short little bits before or after I talk to them uh, that will only be available to patrons of the show. As well, we hope to be able to do merchandise. If we get enough patrons together, we're going we're gonna to put together some merchandise. And as a patron, you will get first shot at the merchandise because it'll definitely be limited in number. As well, you will get a... Uh, a discount, probably at cost, for any merchandise you want. And we may just throw in some free stuff as well. Right now, the donation is only $3 a month. So, if you want all that stuff, and you want to help out the show, that is how you can do it. Um, it will help out a great deal if we get a decent number of people on this. The main show will always be free. I am not going to do interviews that are available to Patreons only. If we get enough Patreons, we may put together some special broadcasts for Patreons only, but uh, only if we get a good number of Patreons contributing. The point of the show has always been to reach as many people as possible with these ideas, these stories, these, uh, these concepts, these theories. Um, so making them exclusive really defeats the whole purpose of the show. The full archive is always going to be free on wheredidtheroadgo.com, and uh, the show itself will always be freely available to anyone who wants to hear it. Anyway, if you want to help us out, go to the website, wheredidtheroadgo.com. It's right up uh, on top of the upcoming shows, a link to the Patreon page. And even if you can't donate, if you just want to share it around and encourage other people to become patrons, everything is appreciated. Now, tonight, I have four stories for you, and uh, two of them are a bit long, but uh, definitely worth the listen. This first one, in particular, is especially creepy. I'll give you my thoughts on it when we get to the other side. Yeah, my name is Stephen Butler. Um, I'm an ordained minister of uh, eight years now. I also work full-time as a hospice chaplain and... Uh, Grief, grief support specialist as well. Okay. And you had a, a very kind of dark experience. I did. Um, <clears throat> my son, this happened while my wife was pregnant with him. So it's been a little, little over four years ago now. Um, I started working at a, uh, a little company. I took a, a big pay cut because I was working all the time at strange hours. So I I started working at this plastics company here in town um, so that I could be off on nights and weekends. Um, there were two owners of this company, and um, they were they were pretty terrible guys. Um, and one of them was a re real, real hateful guy. He, uh, he would always, you know, degrade the employees and cuss at them. And uh, 
he was just a re- really terrible guy. And um, usually on my way way to work, I would uh, I would pray for him and you know just pray that you know God would bless him that we'd have a good day. Um, but after about <clears throat> after about two months, it just kind of started to wear on me, and uh, sure. I kind I kind of developed a, uh, a a bitterness toward him, and that's when all the uh, strange things begin to happen. Um, at night, usually I would walk around my house and and uh, and pray, you know, talk to God and pray over my family. And um, I started noticing there was a spot outside my uh, bedroom window. And the closer that I would get to that spot, I would just get a very sickening feeling like something really bad was there. And uh, I never gave it much thought, uh, but it, it kept happening every night, every night. And... Um, one night I, I fell asleep on the couch and um I um I heard these voices. Usually my wife would come and wake me up in the middle of the night and tell me to come get in bed. But <clears throat> I heard these voices and it sounded like if you were to go to a shopping mall during uh Christmas holidays, how there's just hundreds of people just talking at the same time. And it sounded like this in my living room. And, uh, hmm. man, I opened my eyes to the fright of my life. And it was, uh, the only way I can describe it was uh, this demonic creature was floating right above me, maybe about two feet directly above me. And its face was um, was like porcelain. It was white. And um, have you ever seen those Chinese dragons that... Uh, they use in uh, like parades in Chinatown and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it had a uh, like a face like that kind of a decor. You know, its mouth was real gnarled, and it had um, it had teeth like a shark, but they were real jagged and curved. And I mean, it was a nasty looking thing. Um, and its eyes were solid orange, um, and and gl- they were like burning orange. And it had a, uh, I guess what they call an elliptical pupil, kind of like a, like a snake would. It just run up and down, and uh, it was wearing like a black tunic, um, like a cloak almost. But it was real lofty, kind of like its clothes was even alive. You know, it was just real flowing and lofty. And mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> as soon as I got a good view of this thing, it just disappeared, like. It was pulled out of the room, kind of like, uh, almost like a bungee or something. And it was, the, the only way I can describe it, it was, it was kind of like, um, oops, you weren't supposed to see that, you know, almost like it was a fluke thing. But it, uh, <clears throat> it disturbed me pretty bad. Um, and probably, uh, I don't know, maybe about three or four nights later, fell asleep on the couch again, <laughs> uh, and I know it sounds it sounds crazy, but I, I used to be pretty bad about staying up late and watching TV, and not so much anymore. But anyhow, I <clears throat> fell asleep on the couch again, and um, this time, what woke me up was that sickening feeling, like um, I told you about the little spot outside. Uh, right. But it was extreme. Um, like I thought I was going to have to wake up and vomit like I, I just thought I was really sick in my stomach when I opened my eyes and went to lift up and get off the couch I couldn't move anything and I've, I've done a lot of research on the uh, uh, the call sleep paralysis mm-hmm. and um, you know I'm kind of on the fence about this but um, <clears throat> I know what happened to me uh, and there's several events that, that kind of go together with this incident that um uh, Kind of leads me to believe it's a little more than, you know, uh, your mind waking up before your body does or what, you know. Um, <clears throat> but anyhow, when I woke up, I had that sick feeling and I couldn't move anything. I could only move my eyeballs because I remember, you know, uh, scanning around in the room to kind of see what was going on. And um, all of a sudden, I looked out the corner of my eye on the back of the couch this uh 
really thick black. It looked like uh, kind of like the black smoke, like if you've ever seen a tire burning. It was yep. a very thick black smoke, and it started to, um, you know, pour over the couch, kind of like in a scary movie. <laughs> and uh, and then it kind of um, it assumed the form of a of a, a person. Like I could clearly see the outline of a head and shoulders, um, and it was much larger than you know any person I've ever seen. Like its features were very exaggerated and um, and distorted. <laughs> and um, this thing put its arm across my throat and my chest area, and it started just pushing down. And at first, I thought, man, this thing is strong, and it, it scared me. I mean, I was terrified anyway, but when it started pushing down on me, like I could hear the couch that I was laying on, it started creaking and and just uh, snapping under the pressure of this thing bearing down on me. Wow. And um, I could see with my eyes that the cushions of the couch was up above my body, like it was pushing me down in it, you know. And um, <clears throat> I heard snapping and popping. And then um, the one thing that scared me most, or the worst the worst thing about this whole incident with this entity was the feeling that just exuded out of it. Like, I, I can't explain it, but I just felt uh, <clears throat> an intense hatred for me. Um, and it, it just it just kind of permeated. It just went right through me. You know? And it was the most wicked, sickening, hateful, angry, ra rageful feeling that I've ever felt in my life. And um, and as soon as it happened, it was over. It felt like forever as it was happening. But, you know, it was over probably in a, a minute or two, maybe. And... Um, so I got up and I started trying to uh, <clears throat> run to the bedroom. And, uh, I mean, it's kind of like on uh, cartoons when people are trying to run and they're really scared. They, their legs just don't work right. And uh, I fell a few times going down the hallway. So I uh, I woke my wife up and I, I said, I said, we need to pray right now. I said, something terrible just happened. And... Um, so she was asking me about it, and I told her what happened, <clears throat> and we uh, we prayed together, and uh, I finally got back to sleep. And um, this part here is uh, pretty strange, but during uh, during that night, as we were sleeping, I felt like something was trying to uh, steal my spirit or pull my soul out of my body or something, and. Um, and it scared me because I felt like I was dying. And uh, my wife grabbed my arm and she said, what's the matter? What's the matter? Because she said that my my body was contorted in such a way that it looked like like I was doing a back bend and something had its arm underneath my back and was just lifting me up off the bed. So it's hmm. something that she, she witnessed this. And... Um, and so we prayed again, and I, I didn't sleep too well that night, but I remember the very next day I felt, uh, you know, terrified because I thought, well, we're about to have a child in the house, and I thought, man, if, if this thing can do this to me and physically harm me, you know, I don't want it to try to do anything to my to my wife or my child because they were kind of like, you know, innocent casualties and all this. And um, about a, a week or a week or two passed, and I started having these uh, these recurring nightmares, and they were so real. Now I've never had uh, dreams this vivid, or I usually don't have dreams that I can remember at all. And you know, most people don't have you know lucid dreams, but um, <laughs> I had the exact same dream every night for you know. Uh, weeks and um and i started waking up with these very strange um marks all over my body like i mean it just looked like 
somebody had just beat on me all night. And I had these bruises in strange places. Um, and they, they were in such places that I there's no way I could bend around with my arm and do this to myself while I was asleep. Right. And plus, there were, you know, handprints on my on both of my legs and both of my arms that would wrap all the way around. Um, you know, I've known some pretty, you know, big, strong people in my life, but, you know, nobody that could grab my arm and their fingers wrap all the way around. I mean, they were, um, they were very distinct handprints. Um, and I mean, you could look right at them and tell that, you know, this is not a normal human handprint. And, um, you know, this is where the story kind of goes a bit off the, uh, reservation and um uh, you know i know people have very uh you know differing beliefs on what aliens are um but man i mean my my personal belief through what i have experienced i believe that you know aliens demons ghosts whatever you want to call them that they're you know the same they're the same things are behind them all i believe um <clears throat> but the dream went like this. I was, I was asleep in my bed and it was winter time, you know, when this was going on. So it, was, it gets pretty cold in Alabama, but not, not as cold as other places. But, um, I remember I'd be asleep in bed and I would see these faces peek out of the wall, almost like they could go through the wall. And, uh, and they would look at me for the longest time, and there was nothing I could do. But then they started to uh, go completely through the wall, and one would grab my arms, uh, like there would be one of them on each arm and one on each leg. And the other one seemed like a leader to these, and he just kind of directed them on what to do. And um, what they looked like were similar to... Um, at the end of Close Encounters of the Third Time, do you remember the real tall, lanky, gangly-looking alien? Um, these things, if they were to stand up straight, would probably be like, you know, 12 foot tall. They were huge. But mm -hmm. they looked so frail and fragile. Um, right. They had no muscle tone. Um, they basically looked like... Um, <coughs> It basically looked like bones with skin stretched over it, and maybe like a, you know, chicken cutlets or something from muscles. It was really bizarre. Um, and in my mind, I, I could think while this was going on, and I thought, these things look so flimsy. Um, but their heads were slightly larger um, than a human head. Their faces were very flat. There was not a lot of contour to their face. Um, and they had little mouths. Um, and their eyes didn't look like the typical gray, I guess, with almond-shaped, really over oversized eyes. They were right. um, Their eyes were just maybe slightly larger than a human eye, um, but jet black. <laughs> and their skin had the appearance of... Um, like it was luminescent, like it almost had a glow to it. They were very bright, almost hard to look at at times. And, um, but they would grab me. And when they did, their, their hands would wrap completely around my, around my arms and legs even. And whenever they would grab me, it hurt terribly. Like, um, like it was almost more than I could tolerate. And, um, I remember being astonished at that because I thought there's no way these things are this strong. It was just abnormally powerful. And, um, but they would lift me up off the bed. Like it was no effort at all. Um, and I'm a little over 200 pounds. So, um, <laughs> I think four, four grown men would, would probably struggle carrying around a 200 pound guy, but they just right. lifted me right up and floated me right out the wall. And I remember um, looking straight up at the sky and there just being 
stars, you know, and um, I remember it being just, I would go from comfortable temperature to extremely cold uh, as soon as they brought me out, which, you know, it was winter time when this happened. And, um, but anyhow, when I woke up, I would have more bruises and more marks like every day. And it got to be pretty bad um, before it come to a stop. And my wife said, she said, this, this ain't right. She said, this is insane. Um, but she would witness it every morning, you know. Right. And, uh, but I would have these little um, triangular patterns. And it was always in the same place. But it was like new every day, almost like it was fresh. Um, and you know how, like, if you go to the doctor and get a shot or have blood drawn, they would it would probably be a little red, just a red speck from where the needle goes in and out. Right. It, it looked like that, but there was like ten dots, and then the next line would be eight dots, and the next line would be seven dots. It was, uh, and it would form a, tri- a perfect triangle. And there's nothing that I could have come in contact with by accident or bumping into it would make that perfect pattern. Right. And they, they were tiny little pricks to just little dots. And um, anyhow, after about two weeks or so of having these dreams, <laughs> I got pretty disturbed because, you know, as a minister, um, I always had a, I guess, a security net of thinking that, we well, you know, God will keep me safe from anything. Um, and I always looked at angels and demons as being, you know, out there in another dimension that they can't really <laughs> too much physically interact with us humans. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, this really has opened my eyes to a lot of things and has changed the way I believe about certain things. Uh, but what I learned is that through something just as simple as harboring hateful feelings toward another person, which, you know, I'm ashamed to admit that because, you know, being a minister, I'm not above uh, failure. I'm not above making mistakes or... I'm sure no um, one is. No, nobody is. Nobody is. Um, but something simple like that can open the door for these things to come into your house, and it doesn't matter. You know, if you're a, a preacher, pastor, um, it doesn't matter. These things are no respecter of persons. <laughs> and um, I kind of come to the conclusion that, you know, when when I first started experiencing that, that spot outside my, my bedroom window, that there was those things waiting to get inside. It was waiting for the perfect moment for the door to be open. You know, you kind of have to invite them into your home. And, uh, you know, unknowingly, I did that through, you know, harboring hateful feelings toward the owner of that company. Um, But the most amazing thing that happened um, is what put a stop to all this. I was uh, driving home from work one day, and I remember my wife being right behind me. And it never happens that we get home from work at the exact same time. It was just kind of a fluke thing. And I remember, um, you know, being upset, and I, you know, I was crying on my way home, and I was really scared, you know, um, you know, all the things that I had experienced. I thought, well, what, what could possibly happen next, you know? And so I said a little prayer, and you know, asked God to, you know, remove these things from my home. And as soon as I pulled into my garage, I got a feeling come over me. Um, that I've never had before or since. Um, It was almost like getting struck by lightning almost, and you just feel absolute perfect peace. Um, It was almost euphoric or, um, you know, an ecstatic feeling. And, you know, tears just streamed out of my eyes because it was the only response that I had to something so amazing as that. And, uh, you know, in the, um, 
in the Christian realm, I guess, you know, people call it the anointing of God or, you know, the presence of God. Um, and I remember feeling absolute confidence and almost authority over these things. And I, I walked in my house and I, uh, I just started rebuking them, you know, in the name of Jesus. And, you know, I never before had any interest in stuff like this, uh, aliens or ghosts even. I didn't, you know, um, care much about it. And I started, when I started experiencing these things, I found shows like your show um, and several others. And I started, you know, really uh, trying to learn more about uh, these topics. Um, but, man, I'm here to tell you that demons are very real. Uh, God is very real. Um, and aliens, whatever they are, are real. Um, and I think it's kind of strange or a little ironic that, you know, I, I kind of almost hit the paranormal lottery. You know, people always, <laughs> uh, I mean, really, <laughs> the odds of all these different things happening to me within a, you know, two-month uh, period of time, I mean, it's just really uncanny. I mean, I went from never experiencing anything to experience almost the whole gamut. I mean, and I, then no, nothing since, right? Nothing since. Not even a creaking door or uh, a, a bump in the night, nothing. But huh. I'm, I see in the back of my mind, whenever I close, uh, shut the lights off at night and go to bed, it's always in the back of my mind that, you know, there are things out there and they don't just go bump in the night, man. They can really, uh, they can really get you. And what did this do to your faith? Did it strengthen it? Oh, absolutely. Um, almost tenfold. I mean, it's just, it's really, um, amazing. Um, and I, I believe I went through that for a reason and I learned a lot through that. Um, and, you know, when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, he really means it, you know. Um, <laughs> and, and it can have, you know, detrimental um, effects on our lives. Uh, and I don't know if there's any correlation between, um, you know, demons or whatever they may be um, picking up on negative vibes and, you know, hate and, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not really sure. There's a lot of things that, you know, we probably will never understand. But it's, um, I mean, it's interesting to think about. And I don't think it's, um, there's, you know, it's just by chance that all this happened. No, no, definitely not. You, you also said you found two broken slats in that couch that you got pressed into. I, I did, I did. And, you know, I, <laughs> this happened about four years ago. Uh, a little over four years ago before my son was born. And I only discovered this, uh, I don't know, maybe in, in the recent year. Um, I mean, we don't let my son jump on the furniture. And, and I don't think, you know, he weighs enough to break slats. And, you know, <laughs> but uh, he dropped a uh, he dropped a little Batman figure or something under the couch. Uh, and it's like a recliner couch. So there's a lot of components to the framing and stuff. So mm -hmm. I, I kick the legs out of, of the recliner and, you know, I can just reach right under there and, you know, grab this little Batman figure. And um, there were these two, uh, I don't know, they're probably like an inch and a quarter by, you know, uh, two and three quarter inches wide slats, like support slats in the, uh, <laughs> in the couch. And they were only broken on the end that that thing was... Uh, the shadow demon or whatever was pressing down on, uh, on the app. So, um, hmm. and I, when I saw that, I was like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is crazy. Ah, now that was a suitably creepy story from, uh, demons to, uh, what seemed to be UFOs or at least alien abduction. I guess there were no lights seen in the sky. So no UFOs, which, uh, makes for an interesting connection there. If these things are all part of the same phenomena, and this is a good example of how they might be. 
And one of the things I always say when you're listening to these stories is it's not fair to dismiss anyone's experiences out of hand. It's one thing if they seem like they're lying, but uh, none of the people I have on tonight came across as people who were lying or making these things up. I think that's a, a rare percentage, and a lot of times you can tell. A story like this is so out there, it's so weird, that it's, it's not the type of thing someone would make up because it's not easily believable. If someone wants to make something up, they're going to tell you a story that fits the preconceived notions of these things. And this, uh, this last story certainly did not do that. Myself, I think there's a, there's a number of interpretations. Of course, there's his interpretation of what was going on, that these were demons, that they were let into his life through this hatred that he had. Um, I would say it's also possible that that hatred projected something outside of himself um, and allowed him to literally battle these demons that were internal and being projected outwards. Uh, it's also possible, and if this happened to me, I might think that this was something trying to teach me something. Um, most shamanic experiences are not necessarily positive things. A lot of times they are very uh, negative-seeming encounters that eventually end up with something good coming of them. We learn far more from negativity than we do from positive experiences. So it's possible that this was something trying to teach him and just using a demonic motive or a uh, motif or the, the mask of a abduction experience. But in the end, he ended up uh, strengthening his faith, if nothing else. All right. So we're going to move on to our next story here. This one comes from John in Newfoundland, and uh, it's a story about Bigfoot. And John asked me to read this one. It's not very long. Uh, it's very simple and interesting. So here we go. Here's John's story. All right. This story comes from John in Newfoundland, Canada. And uh, what John says is about eight years ago, he and two of his friends were heading to a little town called Branch in Newfoundland, about two and a half hours from St. John's, where they live. He says, we were bringing back my friend to his cabin to get his car his uncle was fixing. So on the way back, and I'm just going to use their, their, their initials for their first names. So on the way back, D is in front with his car, and M and I are in M's car. It is maybe an hour or two after sunset, prime time for wayward moose on the highway. So D is up front with his high beams, and we are 20 feet or so behind, trying to stay in the wash of his headlights. Sure enough, 10 minutes later, a baby moose and its mother wander across the road. So we slow down, keeping our eyes on the wood line just behind the ditch on the side of the road. A few turns later, we speed up a little, and with that, in the ditch on the left side of the road is a giant human-shaped hairy ape. We all saw it when Dee's headlights lit him up, and as our headlights hit him, he was doing that turning back look from the Patterson film, and the damn thing was eye-level with me, sitting in the car, and it was standing in the ditch, staring at me with dark green eyes from the reflection, and without pause, it took two strides out of the ditch and into the woods. None of us had cell phones, and we planned on a rest stop at an old train bridge over a little waterfall, and uh, when we pulled up beside Dee's car and rolled down the window, Dee leaned over and said, did you guys see the hairy naked man in the ditch? And we were speechless, and no one wanted to get out of the car, so we just got back on the road and left. Yes, we have bears, and yes, I have seen bears stumble on hind legs, but this was no bear. This was Bigfoot. All right, thank you, John, for that. And uh, John said he was a skeptic up until this experience, and uh, I've talked to John a few times. And he seems very down to earth. So it doesn't seem like something he was making up, nor is it really a, a unusual story for Bigfoot encounters. Most Bigfoot encounters happen very quickly. And for someone who's experienced seeing these things like John is, it's uh, unlikely that he mis did mistake it for anything normal. What it was? Well, that is a mystery in the end, since we still don't know exactly what Bigfoot is. All right, so this next story deals with Civil War ghosts, this time from the perspective of a medium down in a Civil War battleground. Yes, my name is Cisco, just Cisco, and I'm just a lady here uh, living in Jersey that likes to help, if I can, um, rescue spirits or uh, try to help people understand that uh, ghosts were people, too. And True. try to remember that. 
try to remember that. And you had an interesting experience down in Gettysburg. I did. Two years ago, I decided to just take a last-minute trip. It was just kind of a whirlwind thing, and um, I grabbed my sons and said, let's go just spend the night, Halloween night in Gettysburg. We're about four hours from there, so it was one of those day trip kind of things, and uh, we wanted to get in some some of the little tours and, and the battlefields and stuff like that, but um, I had an ulterior motive. I was really hoping... Um, I had lost my mother when I was 12 and uh, my dad much earlier and that will really, um, a loss like that will really um, trip you up on your journey in life, you know, and I was hoping that maybe they would see something that would convince them that um, there's other things out there that this isn't it. And I just knew if I got them to Gettysburg that they would have an experience of their own. And that was what I was hoping. Plus, I was hoping there might be something I could do to help. And um, it was two years ago, all the battle, uh, all the federal stuff was closed. The parks were closed. And I'm still planning this trip, you know, thinking, gosh, you know, if I'm supposed to be there, if I'm supposed to do this. Because I was getting kind of a pull and a push. I had been getting it for a long time. Go. Go to Gettysburg. Go to Gettysburg. And for me, that's not completely unusual. It might be for other people, but uh, it happens to me uh, uh, quite a bit. So I wasn't sure why I was supposed to go, but uh, I was going to be there. And uh, we got there, and it just so happened, I think, the day before they reopened uh, everything up. So that was kind of neat. And uh, I wasn't sure exactly what I was supposed to do, but I was talking to, I talked to my spirit guides like I'm talking to you. I'm like, you know, if you mm-hmm. want me to go, if you want me to do this, you got to help me. And there was little things like, you know, we couldn't afford a hotel. So all of a sudden I get a coupon, you know, just weird things. Just so <laughs> many of them, you know, it was just so many of them where it's like you get to the point where like, this isn't even a coincidence anymore. This is just getting hysterical, you know, and <laughs> right. so it, it was fun, but it was fun. So we get there and um, I had booked this little tour because you cannot in Gettysburg on Halloween night expect to walk up on one of these battlefields. There are more security there than there are people, you know, and they're expecting this kind of thing. They're expecting ghost hunting groups and things like that to be, you know, so you have to get in with someone else. So we walk into this one place and it's, it's about quarter to 11 and it's a lovely place. I won't mention who. And, uh, this one gentleman who's the guide, he walks in, ominous looking gentleman, about 6'4", in the Confederate uniform, and I'm, I am an empath, and if you don't know what that means, it means you pick up feelings very quickly off of things. Um, there's different kinds of empaths, but one of my strengths is, if I'm in a room with somebody who's depressed or sad, I'm going to know it before I even see them, and that's just something I have. And um, this gentleman was, he just felt so jaded and tired and just like, like, gosh, I got to take another one of these groups out here. You know, it was just one of those feelings. So we listened to him talk. And at one point in time, he was telling us, he looked over at my sons who, you know, they got a rock and roll mama. So they look like they could be (laughs) the sweetest people in the world, but they look like, you know, maybe they could be doing something. So he looked over there, well, he looked over there and he says, there will be no provoking on this tour. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and there was only six people, uh, you know, seven, including Joe in the room. And mm. uh, I looked, it was a very small group. And um, I looked over him and I go, okay, I've let him go long enough. And I raised my hand. And I said, Joe, you have absolutely nothing to worry about from us. We're, we're coming here with love and respect. I'm a soldier. I was in the United States Army. I said, I'm a mother of two sons that would have been old men in this war. I said, I'm here. We're all here out of love and respect. So, you know, you don't have anything to worry about us. And he goes, well, I'm a little apprehensive. He said a woman was slapped across the face last night because she was provoking. And the week before that, a man was punched in the stomach. And, you know, by being rude. You know, I believe he was like singing Dixie on the, you know, on the union side or something. I can't remember. I I can't remember what he said, but I know he said he's punched his stomach. I said, well, we don't have to worry about us. So he went on his field and they give you a little bag full of stuff. And I remember, uh, you know, it's like a thermometer and um, an EMF meter, some things like that, you know, to, to go ghost hunt with. And I just pulled out the dowsing rods and the EMF meter because, as I said, I can I can feel things, but I can't hear them if they are 
st- if they're caught in their death state, if they have not crossed yet, I don't have that ability to hear, hear to hear them speak. So I thought I'm going to need something to communicate. So I got the dowsing rods because I thought they might be familiar with them. They were around back then. We're right. talking, you know, we're going back 150 years. It also happened to be the 150th year anniversary, which was amazing. So uh, I handed the bag to my sons. I said, here, you guys use the night vision, whatever you want. Just, you know what I'm here to do. Just, you know, stay over there with it. And and they've been taught to be respectful about things like that. And we put our prayers and protection down and everything else. So we're all walking out and I'm I'm hanging toward the back. And I kind of yanked on, on Joe's little Confederate uniform there. And I said, uh, Joe, I said, if you don't mind, I said, uh, I, you heard me what I said before. I said, when we get out in this field, if, um, I want to do a little experiment of my own. I said, I promise I'll be respectful. And um, if, if, would you trust me if I said, I need to stay here and stay quiet for a moment? Would you take the rest of the group off? And he says, well, what are you going to do? You're going to try to get some EM- EVPs or anything like that? And I said, no, Joe, I'm going to cross them. I said, they've been here long enough. And if I can get one to listen to me, if I can get one to overlook the fact that we're, you know, another group is coming out here, if I can get them to read my intent, I think I might be able to get them to go. And he just looked at me and I said, would you trust me to do that? And he said, I think I would. Hmm. So we go walking on the field. And he's telling his little spiel. There's a big tree, big, huge tree. You got to you know, this thing is a couple hundred years old, more. And uh, I stopped and I got a feeling. And I looked up and I got another feeling. And I said, hey, Joe. And I said, this tree, and I tapped on the tree, and he said, oh, yes. He said, that's a witness tree. That tree was here during the battle. It saw everything. And I said, yeah, Joe, I know. They're sitting in it. I said, go. Hmm. I said, go. And he just smiled at me, and he took the group off, probably a football field away. I was amazed. So what I did was I took the EMF meter, if you're familiar with those, the ones that light up in an arch. Yep. And I said, Hello. And I stated my name, and I said, uh, I'm a soldier. I said, I know I don't look like one to you, but I promise you I am. Can you read my intent and know that I'm telling you the truth? Because that's they, they're telepathic. They can pick this up. And uh, I said, I apologize for, for the people that have come here before me and probably been rude or asked you uh, impertinent questions. I said, I'm not here to do that. I'm not here to waste your energy. I realize how much energy it takes to answer these questions. Do you believe me? And the thing lit up. And I said, Mm. okay. Okay. And I laid it at my feet because I couldn't hold the dousing rods without that in my hand. So I said, okay. You you understand me. Fantastic. And I put the dousing rods in my hand. And I said, do you know how to work these? If I can get a yes, what would be your yes? And right away they started crossing. And then they uncrossed. I didn't even have to tell them to uncross them. And I said, okay, you guys have done this before. And then I said, okay, again, I'm going to say, I am here to help you. And I said, um, I was asking a very slight question. I said, I don't care what side you fought on. I said, I come here as a soldier. I come here as a mother. I said, those two sons, I said, those two boys standing over there, those are my sons. They were born in Alabama. I was born in New Jersey. I said, somewhere along the way, we all came together. There's no fight anymore. There's nothing that you have done here that will be forgotten. You know, you are remembered. But I'm here to tell you that your fight is over. And I got, I said, do you understand that? And they were not just lighting this up, Soraya. They weren't just, you know, like going all the way up to the yes. You could hear. I could feel like a hesitation. And the lights would kind of hesitate and then go all the way up. Like, yeah, kind of. That kind of feeling. Or Mm -hmm. I would yes like a yes and it would go right up and i promise you as god is my witness my hand over my heart every time i asked a question the if for for a yes the emf meter would light up and go back down and then the dousing rods would cross and uncross every single time it was they 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 knew what they were doing they knew what was happening and they were on board with it so I was trying to very, very gently, I didn't have a lot of time, I was trying to very gently explain and kind of see where they were, at, you know, at the moment. I felt that at this point in time, I had three standing in front of me. And I said, uh, t- 
to the gentlemen that are standing in front of me, may I please speak to the highest ranking officer? Because usually you can get more to follow that way. Mm. And uh, I said, uh, can I speak to the, the highest ranking? Uh, I didn't say officer. I said person. Can I, uh, the uh, person. And uh, I said, am I speaking to that person now? Because I felt the energy shift. And it went, yes, yes, cross, uncross. And I said, oh. Okay, I said, uh, do you see at times that things around you have changed? Maybe not all the time, but do you see that sometimes? Because the veil thins for us, it thins for them. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah. So, so the, you know, what they see all the time might not be what they, you know, back and forth. So the thing went, yes, like it lit up more than it kind of almost brighter and uh, and then crossed. And I said, okay. And I said, I, I noticed that this tree and this tree line here, that was like a wood line there, you know, a, a, um, a thicket. And I said, that probably hasn't changed much. But I said, you notice that people speak differently. Uh, people might be dressed differently. And I said, and I, they're probably speaking more rudely. Because you have to understand, we're talking about a time where when a man and wife were married, went into town, they called each other Mrs., Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Hmm. You know, that, yeah. that was how. And then you've got people coming every hour on the hour, seven days a week, coming in and going, hey, you know, what was the war like, you know, and asking them all <laughs> these impertinent, rude questions that seems rude to them, you know, even more so than it would to us, you know. So from their point of view, and, and right now that's what was important is their point of view. So um, I, I got a few questions like that answered, and it seems like, yes, they were seeing a difference. And um, um, I told them that... Um, well, you know, I need you to, to, to connect into my in, my intent. Do you see that um, uh, I'm going to ask uh, your loved ones? I said, I know that you've missed your loved ones. And I got this one one very erratic guy. Um, it was a male energy that was kind of like pacing back and forth, very high energy pacing back and forth. Like, what do you listen to her for? They just come and they ask these questions and, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. And, you know, we got things to, it was kind of that kind of thing, almost doing like a figure eight back and forth behind it. And I said, I understand that, that you feel that what, what you did here was, um, I'm forgetting the word I used, uh, horrific, okay? Because you understand, this battle where I was standing, this is the one where the prisoners were going, they went and emptied out the prisons to, to, to try to get men to come and fight. These people fought uh, hand to hand. Um, right. they, they were out of weapon. They were out of ammo. They were every, They were picking up arms and legs and fighting. I mean, this, the things that these young people saw were absolutely, no person should have to say. And these, some of these guys were still stuck there. You know, and um, I told him, I said, I'm a soldier. I understand. You did what you had to do. Now, you also have to think, what were they growing? What was coming up back then? Uh, probably Baptist, probably, you know, a lot of Protestant, probably a lot of things. And that was very black and white. You know, you were good. You went here. If you did anything bad, you went somewhere else. And a mm -hmm. lot of these guys were afraid to cross. And that's what I was picking up right then. It took me about a good 10 minutes to get to that point with them. And I said, okay, listen, I said, I'm here to tell you, you're going to have to trust me on this one. I need you to really look into me and understand that I believe this with my whole heart, that there is nothing, there's not that kind of judgment in that light. Your loved ones are in that light. There's nothing but your love and peace in that light. And the um, commanding officer, I said, do you remember ever seeing the light? And it was kind of hesitant and um, at that point in time, Joe had come by and dropped a flashlight at my feet, just a little pen light. And I'm sure you've seen people do that, turn the flashlight on for yes and no. I never had to sure. say I never had to say a word for them to include that. It was just amazing because then it was the flashlight went on, the MF went up, and the Tulsi rods crossed. It was absolutely phenomenal, you know. And I'm trying to stay in the moment. And at that point, the flashlight was down there. Because I said, do you remember seeing a light? Can you look around and see the light now? And it hesitated. And then all of a sudden, the flashlight went on, but it got brighter, it seemed. I, I don't know how, a surge of energy, maybe like, and at the same time, I was feeling like, yes, exclamation point. You know, that kind of feeling I was getting, and they all lit up and, and, and crossed. And I said, okay, now I need everybody that's willing to listen to me to connect in 
do you think about your loved ones? Do you have loved ones, a mother, a father? We talked about that a little bit. I said, remember what it was like to hug them. Because it's it's one thing to remember a loved one. It's another one to feel, to remember how it felt. I know that sounds strange, but when you remember that, you kind of connect into that warm, that love energy, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And this one gentleman, the one that was walking back and forth erratic, um, he had stopped and was listening at this point, was standing off to my left. And I got the saddest feeling. And the feeling I got from him was, who could love me? Who could love me? He said it like three times. The feeling came three times on that. And I said, um, did you have, do you have a family? You know, grandparents? Because you got to think some of them are orphans, right? Yeah. Um, and he's like, and I kept getting, no, 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 no one loves me. No one loves me. That's the feeling I was getting. And I said, am I correct to understand that you're saying no one could love you? And the just the dousing rods cross, because I'm guessing I'm dealing with just him now. And I said, okay. I said, did you ever have a pet? Or did you fight next to one of your comrades that you felt like could be like your brother? And right then he's like, yes. Like he got some hope. Like it, it, it lifted. I could just tell you it lifted. And I said, that's love. I need you to focus there. Focus there. That's love. And when I had them all focusing on that, that's when I said, okay. To my spirit guides, my angels, my love energy, my the, the ones that have passed before me, my elders, theirs. And I said, you know, for their angels, everybody, I said, come and get them. Come and get them. Come and get them. And I mean, I looked up at that point because I was looking up towards where I was feeling this, this pull. It was almost like a little vacuum kind of feeling. And Joe is standing next to me, six foot four. I'm five two. He's six foot four, so it's a big kind of thing, kind of startled me, like, tears rolling down his face. And he's praying. And he's just praying. And I thought, this is awesome. This is perfect. I said, come and get him, come and get him. So I kind of feel, you feel like a pull, like an energy leaving, like the same way it came in, you feel it leaving. And I could feel that there was one still there. And I said, um, do you see the light? I said, gather all who will listen to go into the light. Your loved ones are in there. And nothing lit up. And then all of a sudden, I kind of, like I said, I feel this like kind of like a little pull, like a, like almost like a, I want to say a wind, but it was less than a wind. And the dowsing rods start to move. And I thought it was just a bounce, like a, a reflex, you know, from the pull. But they mm -hmm. kept coming. They kept coming, the dowsing rods, they crossed, and they kept coming up, and I'm wearing a heavy leather jacket. They came up, and they went up against my arms, and they squeezed into the leather, and I'm just watching it. And as I'm watching these dowsing rods just literally squeezing into the arms of the jacket the way I was holding it, I'm realizing I just got a hug from a ghost <laughs> on the battlefield in Gettysburg on Halloween night. And then they just released and you could feel the energy just, and that was it. They were gone. They didn't all wow. leave. They didn't all leave. I count, I, I, if I had to count, I'd say seven. So maybe seven. But uh, it, it was quite amazing. Um, I, didn't, I didn't hear till after because my sons were like off around. They stayed about, you know, maybe 10, 15 feet away from me. Uh, their cameras wouldn't work. Their, um, their uh, little voice recorders were dead, completely dead. All the anything that really had a battery in it, other than the EMF and that little flashlight, everything just went out. And after that, right toward the end, I I found out my son said, "Can I please take a picture of my mom? Is it okay? Can I get permission to?" And he got that one picture of me getting the hug. And then after that, the camera really wouldn't work. He got like one or two pictures. He snapped off, and it was it. But uh, and then they didn't work again after that. So go figure, right? <laughs> but how about that, right? Isn't that amazing? It is. It is. And you sent me a few of the pictures here. So uh, there's a picture of me. You can kind of see a woman standing there with long red hair. That's me. And in yep. front, there's seven little red lights right in front of me. And that's when he had asked for permission. And I found out he had asked. For, he couldn't hear what I was saying. He was off uh, about 15 feet away. He wasn't really listening. He kind of got gists of it. But they've been taught not to get involved. Just stay back and put protection and pray. But... Um, I think, I don't know, it could be orbs, because I'm telling you right there, 
that's where I felt them standing. And if I count them, there's seven. But it could also be a reflection of the, because uh, it had rained before, it could be a reflection off the gla- grass. It could be anything. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Uh, but it's just weird that I would get spots right where I was feeling them stand because it was kind of like three and then a group of two and then a couple other ones off to the side. It was crazy. And then there's another one where something goes shooting by. It could be a bug. could be anything. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, it does kind of look like a bug. Doesn't it kind of look like a bug, like maybe a flash, you know, you can almost see yeah. wings, but but you never know. That's why I'm saying we've out-teched ourselves. So at this point in time, if I do something like this, and I don't do this often, this was something that was special that I had been pulled for several years to do. I mean, almost to the point where I'm thinking, gosh, did I fight in Gettysburg? Or was it because I was a soldier and I'm open to this? And maybe my spirits got with their spirits because they will work together. You know, sometimes like she's going to listen. She's going to do it. We're going to, you know, get them. It's just the world I'm in. You, weird things happen, you know. And it, <laughs> that to does. us, it's well, to us, it sounds, you know, odd. And then you, you know, gosh, you get in this long enough and you're going, that's, it's as normal as can be, you know? <laughs> and, and I honestly, I had, I have full compassion for these, uh, for these guys who were 150 years. Can you imagine being stuck in the same thing, doing the same thing over and over again, or being afraid to leave? That's not, you know, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be. You know, and I can't imagine just going in there and getting evidence and, you know, and um, and knowing, OK, well, Mabel's here and, you know, we're just real happy to have her. Your ghosts aren't pets. You know, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. you know it's a person, you know, and it's uh, it, it, and it is, if it was me or, or someone I loved, I'd want them to get some kind of a help. So that's what I'm I'm trying to do that as much as I possibly can, if I can. You know, and uh, that was a, a really quite an experience. And I, I would love to go back and and do it again. But uh, with fifty over what fifty three thousand in three days dead, you know, wow. there's people all all over there. And I can remember a um, what I remember before, which is one of the things. I mean, two years before I I went and thought about this, I was reading a book um, that Mark Nesbitt had written and I saw um, a video that backed that up on one of the specials that they had and he went into the Farnsworth attic where um, they had set up snipers and apparently that's where the shot came that uh, killed Jenny Wade are you familiar with that yeah vaguely Okay. well they went up there and they had to do the same type of thing they brought a gentleman in there who dressed as a chaplain and he went in and he spoke to them as if he was there in their time and said, you know, there is no judgment in the light. You need to go. And they finally listened because they were so oppressed back then to think that if they had done anything wrong, that uh, they, they they knew what they know what's going on here. They're here. They're going through it every day. And although it's not fantastic, it, you know, going through that light could be something awful. And um, but uh, I think at that point, if you can get them to connect into the love energy, they they see their loved ones, and their loved ones are going, "Come on, you know." And that's the mm. cool part. Yeah, that's the cool part. So we'll never know. Um, I had a very vivid dream about I'm going to say probably six weeks later, and um, a lot of times spirits who are crossed can come and visit you. Have you ever heard of a visitation dream? You know, sure, a lot yeah. of times, like, Grandpa, I'll come and sit on your bed and go, it's okay, I'm fine, and whistle or whatever, something normal. Right. And it's more real to you um, than, a, than another dream might be. It's just a different feeling. Well, this is one of those dreams, and I'm walking down, you know, like you walk down the tunnel, the typical tunnel, with the foggy kind of light, you know, and you can see people, but you can't really see the front of them because they're backlit. And I'm walking down this little tunnel, and I don't know if you ever uh, saw the movie uh, Five People You Meet in Heaven. It's a great movie if you've never seen it. It's a great, even better book. But for some reason, I'm thinking about the five people I meet in heaven. It's, it's in my head while I'm walking down this tunnel. And I saw these maybe three, four faces and some of my loved ones, but for some reason I wasn't drawn to them. I'm, I'm walking up to this one guy. He's wearing a funny shirt, almost like a Amish looking, like handmade type shirt with uh, suspenders and some kind of blue pants. I don't know with jeans or what. And he's got his, his little hat 
in his hands, like in front of him. And he's the person I focused on. And I walked up to him and I'm just one of these, you know, old soldiers, you know, right there. I'm right there when I shake your hand. How you doing? You know, and I stick out my hand and I'm like, do I know you? And telepathically, they, he did not move his mouth, but I could hear it clear as day. and had a little southern accent to it. He has one hand in it hat in his hand and he reached out and shook my hand and he pulled me in as he did it and he pulled me in like to hug me he put his arm around me and he whispered in my ear and he said I spoke to you in the field <laughs> and I promise you the guy smelled like corn like a, like it <laughs> you know like if you walk through a cornfield and snap an ear right off the stalk that smell that fresh green yep. corn that's what it smelled like it was so vivid and I woke up so I don't know Maybe nice. maybe he's one of the guys. You know, I'd like to think it w it really happened like that. But I know I got that hug, and that was very cool, very cool. So that's what I'm saying. You can have experiences like that instead of, you know, I know there's people that want to go get evidence and and things, and there's nothing wrong with that. But remember that when you're doing that, you're taking their energy, and it takes them a long time to build that up. So just knocking on the table takes a lot of energy, you know, and sure. and. And try not to be so desensitized. I mean, now we'll talk about, well, the glass floated across the room. Isn't that something? Wait a minute, what? The glass floated across the room. <laughs> yeah. It takes them a lot of energy to do that. And, they're, and that might be the only thing that they can do. It's very much like that movie Ghost, believe it or not, as Hollywood and crazy as that was. There's a lot of truth in that, where it took um, the character so much to move that penny up the wall you know it took him so right. long to learn that and um, if they've got something that they can do and then you're paying attention to it and they're banging on that table and you go two twice for yes twice for no ask them you know are would you listen you know if we bring somebody in here can we help you get to where you need to be you know some people are going to be you have to understand that if they have not crossed, they still have all their earthly personalities with them. They've not crossed and learned and, and learned through that. Does that make sense? So if they were, let's put it this way, if they were hard to get along with and kind of jerky when they were here, they're going to kind of be that way even more agitated right. now. Right. So a lot of, of times, oh, yeah. So a lot of times people think, oh, it's a negative energy. No, it's somebody who's pissed in life and he's mad now too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't mean that, you know, um, and that's why you really need some people that can go in there. I'd say take a whole group in there, take a, you know, take a medium, take a psychic, take your equipment, take all the tech stuff, everything, but be sure, you know, um, because um, you never know guessing that this is Mary because somebody named Mary died in the house, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not good for, for the spirit who is there, you know, and like I said, there are people too. And um, I'm going back to Gettysburg. So if anybody wants to go back, <laughs> <laughs> what a neat place, huh? And thanks to Cisco there for her story about, uh, well, getting a hug from a ghost. You can check out the pictures she was talking about on com when the podcast goes up. And now for our final story of the night. This one comes from Eric in Minnesota. And it's a, it's a recount of a few different things that happened to him. A haunted house, an encounter with a sort of a doppelganger, some weird weather events and synchronicities, and, uh, well, I'll let him tell you all about it. I listened to your show, and uh, a few things you talked about have kind of sunk with me, so I just figured I'd make a list of things that happened with me to you and see if you found it interesting, so. All right, well, uh, give us a few of them. Um, I... It's, um, okay. Well, do you want to start? <laughs> well, I lived in a haunted apartment in California when I, uh, moved out there for a little while. That was, it was something that was not scary to me, but it was scary to my roommate. I didn't really realize it at the time, but, uh, we lived there for a little bit and all of a sudden, uh, we would, my friend would leave the window open in his bedroom and he would come over and be closed. He would leave wow. the light on. He'd come home at night and be off and it was stuff I didn't notice, but he did. And I'm like, really? He goes, yeah. I'm like, well, let's keep an eye on it and see what happens. And it kept happening. And I'm like, well, all right, this is, you know, oh, this is different. And then all of a sudden one night, 
one night we were uh, watching TV in one of the side rooms, and all of a sudden through the main room, out of the, you know, the corner of your eye, you see something walk, you know, see a person walk by, there's a shadow. It wasn't a shadow person because it, it wasn't negative. But anyway, I looked at him, and he was looking out the, out the door at it too. And all of a sudden he looked at me, I'm like, he goes, I don't want to know. I'm like, just, all right, just tell me you saw something, and I'll shut up. He goes, I saw something. I'm like, all right, that's cool. <laughs> and all of a sudden, after the hat, because he knew I was into the paranormal, he he was kind of cat. He's Catholic, so it kind of freaked him out a little bit. But he knew I was into the paranormal, so it didn't affect you know affect me. But all of a sudden, as I thought about it, afterwards he wouldn't spend the night in the apartment anymore. He'd spend the night at his girlfriend's house, and I didn't quite make the connection at first. I'm like, well, okay, whatever. But and then all of a sudden, it would just it would just be it wasn't negative things. It was always kind of positive things, which was kind of weird to me, as you know, notoriously. But I'm like. Well, this is at least still not bad, so it's not negative, but it kind of freaked out my roommate. And all of a sudden, he was, uh, all of a sudden, one day I was washing dishes, and I we had some cast iron skillets that he liked to use, and I hated them because they're such a pain in the butt to wash. And all of a sudden, I went out to take out the garbage, and they literally came back, came back in, and they were gone. I'm like, where'd you, you didn't wash them, did you? He goes, what? Those cast iron skillets. He goes, no, I hate them. I'm like, I do too. They're gone. He said, what? I'm like, they're gone. I don't know where they are. I'm like, well, and I looked in the cabinets, and also they were washed, dried, put away in the cabinet. I was like, well, that's cool. He was like, really? I'm like, I didn't watch them. He's like, well, this might not be so bad. I'm like, oh, okay, that's nice, I guess. But it yeah, would keep he, happening where, where he, he would, he got to the point where he was like, look at me and say, see, the kitchen light's on, and, you know, I'm like, all right, we come back, it's off. He goes, it's off. I'm like, yeah, I know. And he gets the floor, I'm like, well, cool, thanks, I guess. And he would keep spending the night at his girlfriend's house, and all of a sudden I was, there was one night where he had a, he had a problem with one of his coworkers, that, you know, and it was to the point where he was going to come by the apartment and try to scare, you know, cause trouble or whatever it was, and I was kind of freaked out about it. And I was home alone in the apartment, and I was kind of freaked out about it, and I went to bed, and all of a sudden, I had, like, this blanket of calm where all of a sudden I felt, like, totally safe and, like, nothing was going to happen. And it was really weird. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool, I guess. So all of a sudden, I, I went and woke up and nothing happened. And it was kind of weird. But it was just, it was always kind of positive things. So it was kind of strange. But that was about well, it. I, but, I, I would say anytime you have ghosts washing your dishes, that's a positive thing. Yeah. And, I, and it, you know, it, you know, I had a paranormal background, so, you know, it wouldn't scare me too much. But I was like, well, this ain't so bad. But. <laughs> we eventually just ended up moving out just out of necessity, but it was never, it was kind of weird, but I've, you sit? I've had, as I think about it, I've had like kind of natural, like weather strange things happen to me through my life. And I was just like, well, maybe this doesn't just happen to everybody. But growing up, I used to sit outside during the rain and I screamed in porch and kind of watch the rain and thunder and stuff. And I, one of the neighbor's trees got struck by lightning and I saw that and I was like, Whoa, that's cool. But and I, uh, I also my parents moved to another town, and I lived there for a while. And the house got struck by lightning when I was there, which was pretty crazy. It was just loud and sparks off the roof, and we blew out all our just our electric stuff. But there was no fire or anything. And then, like within a month or so after that, a tornado was really close to the house. My dad called me up. He's like. Be careful, because it's like, you know, a tornado coming, you know, it's supposed to be really close to the house to keep your eyes open. I'm like, all right. And I hung up, and I was looking around. There's a clear blue sky. I couldn't see anything. It looked fine to me. And all of a sudden, I started this whistling sound. I was like, what? I'm like, oh, it is close. It is so close. It's pulling the, pulling the it's, it's so pressurized that it's pulling the air out of the house. So I ran around, opened all the windows. It did not cause any damage. And it missed our house by about a city block. And all huh. it was all over. I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, that was cool. I guess we we're lucky." So <laughs> that was kind of weird. But now you but, said you uh, met your own living doppelganger too. Yes, in real, that was very. It was strange because uh, growing up, I had a couple friends that uh, I was sixteen, so I had my driver's license, and we used to always go to uh, Perkins in the neighboring town and start kind of hang out and stuff. And all of a sudden, two of my good friends came up to me one day and like. We saw your twin. I'm like, what? They're like, me and 
my, we was like, the two of us went up to the sky thinking it was you. And we walked up and said, hi. And looking at him dead in his face, it took us a second to realize it wasn't you. I'm like, really? He's like, he looked exactly like you. It took us a second. I'm like, wow, okay. Well, yeah, it was strange. I'm like, all right. And, and then, like, through, through within a few years, I would have also one of his, one of his friends would walk up to me and talk to me. And I, I knew I was going. I knew he thought there was this other guy, but I just kind of played along to see, to see how much I really looked like this guy. And I played along like I knew who this guy was. And I talked to this person for five or ten minutes and he walked off from a difference. And even I'm like, <laughs> wow, I was this much like this other guy? And it was strange. And uh, when I was married, my wife said that uh, when she was at work, she saw this guy and she walked off all mad because she, she saw him with another female. And she walked mm. up to him and she was like, she, even she was like, yeah, it took me a second to realize it wasn't you. I'm like, really? She goes, yeah, he's your twin. You know, not, you know from, my, from my wife at the time, I'm like, whoa. She goes, yeah, I was so mad until I realized it wasn't you. I'm like, oh, okay. And then I used to, it was kind of funny because I used to go to, I used to race off-road trucks with a couple friends of mine. And we were at one of the truck rallies. And all of a sudden, this group of people were kind of looking, there was like three or four people looking at me kind of like they weren't quite sure because I wasn't with people that they knew. And I was with my two friends, and my friend noticed it. And he looks at my other friend and he goes, watch this. He was like, what? He was, just watch. I'm like, I was like, kind of laughing. I'm like, well, we'll see. The group of people walked up to me like, hey, how's it going? And my two, my two friends were like kind of confused. I'm like, no, no, you know, I'm pretty good. What's going on? They're like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Where's your truck? My goal, I broke it. I'm sitting there with a friend's mind, just hanging out. And I talked to him for a couple of minutes, and they kind of walked off, not knowing the difference. And my friend looked at me like, who's that? I'm like, I have no idea. My other friend's like, that's how much it looks like this little guy. He's like, really? <laughs> yeah. He's like, wow. I'm like, yeah. I, I, and one time I actually saw him driving down the road. He, was, he drove up next to me, and he looked at me and said, hey, am I your twin? And I had my friend in the car, and I looked at him, I'm like, I, am I? He goes, yeah, that's what you look like. And I looked at him and I was kind of, just kind of vain, like, really? He goes, yeah, that's you. I'm like, oh, okay. And I, I, just, I didn't do nothing about it. I didn't do anything about it. I just kept driving. And my friend was like, really? I'm like, eh, whatever. And I haven't <laughs> seen him since because so I kind of moved out of the area. But it was just, it's so, it was just so weird. I'm like, okay, whatever. Yeah, that's pretty freaky. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, uh, I, a person I lived with, we'll say, was uh, was psychic to the point where all of a sudden her best friend was giving birth, was about to give birth, and she looked at me and said, we have to go. I'm like, what? Yeah, she's giving birth right now. We have to go, you know, go help her until we can. I'm like, all right, whatever. And, we, and I just accepted it. I didn't question. I always kind of knew. I'm like, well, you know, to me it wasn't a big deal. But I'm like, all right, let's go. And she, her friend was not supposed to get pregnant, more or less have a child. And they said that the doctor said that there's a good chance that something will go horribly wrong. And I ended up taking her to kids and watching them while my wife at the time stayed with her. It was a full moon on Friday the 13th, and she gave birth with no issue at all. And I didn't think it was laughter. Well, at least she's you know, healthy. That's cool, I guess. But it was kind of weird. But um, she's... My, I have a daughter who was, when she could barely speak, it was really weird because all of one time she, the phone rang and she uh, said it was, it was so-and-so. I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, it's so-and-so on the phone. And we're like, what? And the phone rang and rang. I took a second. I picked it up. I'm like, yep, yeah, it's her. They're like, okay. And she could barely speak. And this was not a person I called us all the time either. It was really strange. I'm like, okay then. Well, that's cool, I guess. But. Um, yeah, that person I knew at the time, she was psychic, and then she started to kind of read books on how to focus your, your psychic energy, and she kind of flipped into a telekinetic thing where she could move stuff with her mind, like a pol- it was like poltergeist activity, but I knew it was her. And right. it was just one of those things that just kind of happened, and we just accepted it. Like, what? Like, oh, it's just her. It's like, really? No, yeah, she does that now. So, like, okay, <laughs> then. That just happens. And people are like, it, that doesn't just happen. You well, know, it does now, but whatever. So it's kind of funny, but uh, so that was always that was kind of something that always happened. And she would always, 
if anything, if she ever questioned me, you know, if she ever wanted me to do something, the scene kind of like, well, I need to go do this because I had a dream or a vision that something bad is going to happen. It wasn't a question. You would just, it was just safer to do it than not. It's like, well, I'd better be safe than sorry. Because it's usually our children. I'm like, okay. And I would just do it. You're like, really? I, it's better. It's safer not to. It's safer just to do right. it. So, but, um, yeah, I, growing up, I kind of, I, Watch what kind of got me into the whole kind of paranormal thing is as a kid I saw <laughs> I'm dating myself I saw the shining preview as a kid mm-hmm. and it scared me so bad I left the theater and kind of at that point I was like I need to know why this scared me and I don't I want to come over this fear of this and see you know what is happening so I started to get into kind of movie how, how horror movies are made by like special effects and stuff and I kind of spun into a kind of a paranormal end of it, and I got really involved in that just kind of on my own, just whatever, you know, books I could find and stuff. And that's kind of what got me interested in it. But uh, I've, growing up, I used to, people want me to kind of investigate houses they thought were haunted. I have no equipment or anything. I would just kind of walk around. I'm like, I, you know, I'm not psychic or anything, so I can't really feel anything. So I you know, I'm not, I never found anything really, but... Um, there were like church groups that thought it was interesting and had me give like little lectures and seminars about paranormal stuff of what I knew just was kind of interest and stuff. And that was kind of interesting, but, uh, so that was kind of cool. Um, I don't, um, well, I, I, was, I like I said, I listened to your show and I kind of, I heard one of your guests talk about synchronicity but it wasn't like an alien synchronicity with me. It was just kind of one of those things that just, my life has kind of been charmed where everything always worked out for me. I've never, it's been really strange. Even I'm like, this just kind of fell in my lap and it kind of always has as I look back. It was really weird, but things just always seem to work out for me one way or the other, which I never complained about, but I never really thought about it either. I'm like, yeah, I'm just lucky. I'm like, this happens to you a lot. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yeah okay, but. Even, it's kind of funny, even the apartment I live in right now, I got evicted out of my old place, and within three or four days, I ended up, uh, I worked for a delivery service, and I delivered to this apartment building, and the uh, the doors were closed, and a person came to the door and opened it because he saw me, and I had to deliver for somebody else in the building, and I saw that there was an apartment for rent, and I was like, yeah, is, that, you know, is there an apartment still available? He's like, yeah, it's mine. Would you like to look at it? I'm like, sure, all right. <laughs> so I came and looked at it, and I liked it. I'm like, well, thank you. I'm like, do you have the, you have the property manager's you know, business card or anything? He goes, yeah, I do. Gave it to me. I moved in within a week later. And I was like, <laughs> wow, what the odds of that? I, I, I was just like, okay, that's cool. But Your life has been kind of like set, set out nicely for you. Yeah, it just seems like my life's been charmed, I guess, kind of as I look back. But yeah. uh, I it was kind of weird because one thing that happened, my uh, dad's sister had a terminal cancer and uh, she knew that she was kind of towards the end and all of a sudden she called me one day just because she, she was going to give me her car and she lives out of state. So she had a question about, I had a question about the car and she called me and I talked to her and said, you know, there's no big deal. I just have to do this kind of paper. Get in. I said, you know, I told her I loved her before I said goodbye, and also the next day she passed away. And I called my mom. I'm like, I talked to her yesterday. She goes, Yeah. She just wanted to say goodbye to you before she left. I'm like, Really? Well, oh, obviously. I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. I guess. Whatever. So that was kind of weird, but. All right. Well, otherwise, that's, that's... I. Um, what else? I'm trying to. I've had. Like just kind of the synchronicity things, I kind of tested on some levels that I, you know, that I can do. And it was kind of funny because I uh, play uh, Dungeons and Dragons with my daughter and a couple friends of hers, and we were just kind of sitting around rolling the dice, a twenty-sided dice. And her friend was kind of rolling it, and I would just kind of randomly say numbers. And all of a sudden, I started getting in sync with him rolling the dice, and I would start to call the numbers as before he would roll them, and I would start being accurate, like more than like 10 times in a row. And I was like, whoa, okay. And we were just kind of talking, not thinking about it. And I looked at my daughter, I'm like, did you see that? She goes, yeah, that was kind of weird. But so that was kind of strange, but. 
Well, you're clearly tuned into something. Yeah, and I, I, it's one of those things where I don't, I never really thought about it until your show, and then I kind of, once you, once you think about it, you become more aware of it and kind of, you know, it becomes more, you know, noticeable. But. All right, my thanks to Eric for sharing those stories with us, those uh, events in his life. And my thanks to everyone who uh, contributed stories to this week's show. I have a bunch more. I plan on doing another one of these probably November 7th, I believe it falls on. And uh, in a few, just a few weeks. Yes, November 7th. Uh, I am going to have someone in uh, from a local shop who has had a lot of encounters. And we're going to probably intersperse some more listener stories with his stories while he'll be in studio here with us. Um, next week is Peter Robbins talking about his new book. Uh, the week after, I have Steve Stockton talking about his own haunted encounters. Uh, then we should have that one on the uh, 10th. Um, Melanie Zimmer returns to talk about uh, folklore and uh, legends of the upstate New York Finger Lakes. Upstate New York and Finger Lakes region, something a little more uh, close to home for us. Uh, and the 31st, I have Nick Redfern coming on to talk at least about his book, Bloodline of the Gods, maybe his new Men in Black book as well. And uh, we'll be doing another part with Aaron Gullius and Mike Cleland on UFO history. Also, if you have any stories you'd like to contribute to a future show, please get in touch. Go to the website, wheredtheroadgo.com. You can message, um, you can email at contact at wheredtheroadgo.com. I'm going to, when I have a moment, put up a email specifically for stories from listeners that you'll be able to email. For now, you can use contact at wheredtheroadgo.com, but just go into the contact section of wheredtheroadgo.com and uh, use the best option. And of course, remember our Patreon account. Help us out. Go to the website. Again, wheredtheroadgo.com. $3 a month gets you into the Patreon, get you a Patreon status with the show. And uh, we'll give you some bonus stuff as well as eventually, hopefully, be able to make some merchandise and maybe add another show into the rotation. So 